how would it, how would it work out? So let's, let's do that right now together. Instead of comparing three groups, let's say I compared seven different groups. Like, how would that be? Well, we have seven different races, maybe, if we have a large enough sample, four, five, six, and seven. Or let's say, for example, somebody's inve investigating a brand new drug to help people drop their blood pressure. So drug number one, people taking the average drop in blood pressure for people taking drug number one. Drug number two might be an experimental drug. Drug number three might, might be a placebo drug. Drug number four might be the same drug ma made by a different company. You know, because seven different versions of the same drug. And you're giving it to 100 people to take each drug in a large, expensive clinical trial. And you look at the, the, the drops in blood pressure of each of those people. And you start, and you want to prove, are all the drugs the same? Or is one drug better than another drug? So you go through the T-test. How many times would you have to do the T-test? If you're going to do the first compared to the second, the third compared to the seventh, the fourth compared to the fifth, how many comparisons are there when you have seven drugs to play with? Yes? No. The first compared to the second, the first compared to the third, the first compared to the fourth, the first compared to the fifth, the first compared to the sixth, and the first compared to the seventh. Then you have the second compared to the third, the second compared to the fourth, the second compared to the fifth. So how many are there altogether? You can really do it on your fingers, really, but how many are there? Anybody there? The formula, for some of those of you who may still remember this from stat one, is seven choose two, which is seven factorial over seven minus two factorial over two factorial, which comes out to 21, believe it or not. Comes out to seven. Now, for those, again, if you don't remember this, we skipped that in chapter five, so you don't have to worry about it, but that would come in handy to to predict uh, how many we'd have. So there are 21, and each, each time you look at them, it's called a pairwise comparison. This compared to that. So we have 21 pairwise comparisons. So now going back to my original question, what's wrong with doing it 21 times? Yes, Paul. So the first question, the first objection, which I often get from students, is that it's not practical. Well, th 30 years ago, when I was sitting with my t teaching this to my classes for the first time, and they told me it's impractical, I, I say they're right. But that's before computers. No, 30 years now, already just type in your numbers in the computer, you press the button, and you press the ANOVA button, and the computer sh sh gives you like 21 t-tests. So it's not a matter of practicality. Nowadays, you do it on a computer. So practicality is not the issue here. It's more of a theoretical, subtle reason why you can't do it 21 times. Yes. Well, okay, you're, you're very astute and very observant, except you got it backwards. Um, so your, your observation is correct, but you got it backwards. If you do it, let's say, so let, let, me, let, me just, let me explain this to the rest of the class, and you'll hear, you hear where you made your mistake, but your basic point was right. Let's assume for argument's sake that all seven drugs are really the same. Let's give that benefit of doubt to day zero, especially the same exact pill with seven different colors, exactly the same pill. Now, do you expect that, and what's, what's going to come out of each of these, but you're going to get a bunch of people taking drug number one, and the average, the average drop in blood pressure is called X bar one. And this is X bar two, and this is X bar three. Remember, we have to distinguish between the average of the population, which we really care about, plus the average of the sample that we're focusing on. X bar five, X bar six, X bar seven. <coughs> so do you think if the H zero is totally true, if you gave it to millions of, sorry, thank you. Um, if, you if, if you gave it to millions of people, then the fact the, the X bar should be the same, because the zero and the X bars when it's really, really large sample size will reflect. But if you gave it to, let's say, 10 people here, and 10 people here, and 10 people here, and 12 people here, and 11 people here, and 10 people here, you think the averages would be exactly the same? The sampling variability. You're not going to get the average of the sample perfectly the same. This is going to be a little bit higher. This is going to be a little bit lower, a little bit higher, a little bit higher, a little bit lower, just by luck. It won't be exactly the same to the fifth decimal place. So when you start plugging numbers into your t-test, do you think x bar 1 and x bar 2 will be exactly the same? No, they'll be close. If, if the a0 really is true, they should be close. But are you guaranteed to come to, what's the right, what's, what will be the right decision here? Accept a0, accept a0, because the truth of the matter is the big a0, the large a0 is true. But do you think if you do this again and again and again and again, you're always going to accept a0? What is the chance of making a type 1 error? which is called alpha, which let's say is 5% conventionally, which is the chance of rejecting the A0 when the A0 is true. 
So what's going to happen if the AC, when you do this, for the, again, each time we do a little t-test, the first compared to the second, the first compared to the third, the first compared to the fourth, the answer should be 95% chance, except A0, except A0, but this, what's, what's the chance of making a type one? What's the chance that just one average might be a little bit higher, another average might be a little bit lower? What is the chance of that happening? What's the chance of making a type one error of saying one group is different than the other group, just by luck? That's what the alpha, the chance of maybe we said when we make these boundaries, we're say we're willing to make that mistake just we don't know from the spinner assignment, but it happens just randomly on occasion. So if you do it just once, what's the chance of making a mistake? Five percent. What if you do it a second time, and a third time, and a fourth time, and a fifth time? You do it twenty-one times. What's the chance somewhere along the line you're gonna make a type one error? Yeah, it won't be five percent, it might be ninety-nine percent. Won't be 100 because never reaches 100. Right? So that's what you were saying, but I think you got it back with a type one, type two error. So the alpha is really going to be, like you know, 99 percent maybe. If you want to calculate, it, it's going to be one minus 0.05 to the 20th power. If you want to calculate it, it should be one minus one minus alpha to the 20th power, something like that. 95 to 95, <coughs> something like, it'll be something like. Oh, no, sorry, not 21 power. which comes out to like 99%. So if we understand why you can't do what's called multiple pairwise comparisons, the question is what can you do? So now, we've, so now we basically demolish the approach that would have been nice to do of using chapter 10 many, many times over. So instead we're gonna try to now to solve the problem um, by another approach, and, and in the remaining seven, eight minutes, I'm gonna show you that approach. I'm not gonna show it to you mathematically, just see it's conceptually, so when I show you the actual formula a week from this Monday, I'm probably, I'll probably, I might have to repeat this quickly, but I'm not gonna spend the whole day explaining the theory of the chapter. So right now we're getting the theory of the chapter. So, so anybody wanna suggest, now okay, I, it's really not a fair question, because unless you had it before, there's very, very small chance you're going to be able to invent the proper method of solving this problem. So in order to make this method a little bit clearer, if anybody wants to say something, I'll be glad to hear it. Anybody have any ideas how you might solve this problem? Well, basically, you want to do this not 21 times, but just one time and get the answer in one shot. Yes? Well, at some point, you got to take, and I know that you're comparing the averages, so you got to take the average of the samples and do something to those averages. Now, you can't say, well, x bar 1 minus x bar 2 minus x bar 3, for example. I think that you were thinking of that before, maybe. That doesn't make any sense because th this, this compared should be zero, and the, but minus the x bar three just throws everything off. So yes, like the average of the averages. Yeah. We say do it like that. I mean, you got to go beyond that. I mean, you're going to yeah. at some point. The fact that we do, in fact, take the separate averages, like you're correct. At some point, we take the average of the averages. That's also logical and that's correct. But that's not really. But that's not the whole method. The method involves something else. But that's. But it is part of the method. Yes. So the name of the chapter is analysis of variance. So instead of comparing the averages directly, we're going to compare the variances. That's another very astute insight. But which variance? So that's what we're going to spend the next five or six minutes trying to explain to you. And to make the example a little bit easier, let's make it uh, three people in every category. And instead of having instead of having instead of having seven groups, let's go back to three groups just to explain the idea behind it. So this is still correct. This is still correct. We're not going to use this formula anymore. So now the question is, how can you analyze the variance to answer the question, are the three groups the same? And it turns out, again, maybe, maybe, maybe saying this in five minutes is not going to be sufficient, but hopefully you get the flavor of it. And, and again, since most of you don't care about the theory of the chapter, we'll get the theory behind us in five minutes, and we'll move on to the practical aspect when we come back. Okay, so let me ask you the question. Why are these three numbers different? Why are the people in the B column, the, the, the blacks, let's say in this case, why are they, uh, these are, again, everybody had nine people taking the same drug, taking drugs. Now, but, you know, let's go back to drugs, it's a little bit easier. We're comparing drug one to drug two to drug three, and these numbers represent the drop in blood pressure, the change in blood pressure, let's say diastolic or systolic blood pressure. And we have three people taking three different drugs. We don't know if the if the three groups, you know, drug one, drug two, and drug three, 
and we want to know whether three drugs are the same or not. So my question is, why are these three numbers different? But before I ask that you answer, me, answer, 